Danganronpa Kirigiri, Volume 2, written by Takakuni Kitayama. Chapter 1, Daily Life. Couples dressed to the nines for Christmas Eve wined and dined in window booths. But due to the height of the building, no matter how much I craned my neck, I couldn't see them satisfactorily. I must have gotten a little carried away, bouncing around the hall to eagerly check out the scenery from outside the windows of this high-rise building, as I felt someone tug on the sleeve of my coat, Koko Kirigiri. She gazed up at me, wordlessly, with cool eyes. I felt almost as if I was being scolded. Thank you for waiting. Please come this way. Both Kirigiri and I followed a waiter into the interior of the hall. Suddenly, an enormous Christmas tree came into view. A fir tree that must have been imported from abroad, decked out in dazzling star ornaments that were determined not to lose to the lights of the city in terms of brightness. We found ourselves being led to a wide individual room an antique candle holder stood in the centre of the table, draped in a white cloth. The candles fully aglow. Napkins and cutlery for three people were already laid out on the table. And the furthest wall was transparent, giving us a scenic view of the city nightscape. Wow, this is amazing! I dashed over to the glass wall without thinking, and gazed out at the city lights twinkling under the night sky. Kirigiri, come here! I called out to Kirigiri, who stood behind me. She seemed to be hesitating. She looked at me with a slightly concerned expression on her face, then approached the giant window. She looked over the city nightscape, with pink-tinged cheeks, seemingly unable to tear her eyes away from the lights of the city. Isn't it pretty? Kirigiri nodded. Won't you tell me how you really feel out loud? It's pretty. At this point, Susei Nanamura entered our private room. Sorry to keep you waiting, ladies. I see you're enjoying my Christmas present to you. By present, did he mean this view? I suddenly felt a little embarrassed at taking the bait so quickly and backed away from the glass wall flustered. Susei pulled out a chair with a gesture that made it seem like this was something that he was well accustomed to. I lowered my head to him in a quick bow and took a seat. I really wasn't used to how to act in a place as fancy as this. On the other hand, Kirigiri seemed used to it. She lowered herself onto the chair, almost princess-like, and gave Susei a casual nod as her thanks. Kirigiri continued to surprise me. But I think she was essentially a refined and well-mannered kid. When it came to being a detective and solving cases, she became cool-headed and almost difficult to approach. But I wondered if that had something to do with being raised in a family of detectives. Susei placed the Santa Claus hat he'd been wearing on Kirigiri's head and sat down opposite to her. He didn't offer any explanation as to why he'd given her the Santa hat and Kirigiri herself didn't react. Well, she looked cute, so I had no complaints about that. Well, I am a happy man, having the honour of spending Christmas Eve with such beautiful young ladies. After sitting down, Susei propped both his elbows onto the table and rested his chin on top of his hands, suddenly observing us intensely. I was bewildered by the suggestive look in his eyes. What? I suddenly found myself feeling very shy. Susie had a face as handsome as an actor. He, he was an attractive man. I had absolutely no objections to joining him for a Christmas dinner. 2,000. 9,800. 23,000. Susie suddenly rattled off a series of mysterious digits. Huh? The price of your glasses, the price of your coat, and the price of your boots. What? How, how did you... He knew. The numbers were more or less correct. 
there are many ways to observe other people, and one of the most effective ways is to judge them by the value of what they're wearing. Though... Through knowing the value of their material possessions, in other words, their quality, is not a method to be overlooked. I... I see. Yui Samideri can, for example, in your case, you're confident about your legs, so your most valuable possession is your boots. However, from the way your boots are worn down, they don't seem to be specifically designed for sports. And you've chosen to walk down the path of becoming a detective. Aiming to become a detective at such a young age is probably due to something that happened in your past. Oh, uh, okay, I got it. I put both hands up in front of me, as if to evade Susei's words. I don't think I wanted to hear anything else he had to say. Susei's lips curled into a grin, and he spread out his arms while gesturing at the clear glass wall. 7,445,000 yen. The price of everything you can see from here, along with the price of electricity for every building. Uh, the true essence of everything is so beautiful. Susei gave me a smug wink. Detectives were really hard to understand. Susei Nanamura was a double zero class detective. According to the DSC, or Detective Shelf Collection, at the Detective Library, his number was 900. The number 9 indicated that he dealt primarily with murder investigations, and his double zero was proof of his skills. In the past, there was a detective who, due to the successful handling of his cases, moved up as far as rank 3, but that took over 20 years of his career. For Susei Nanamura to hold a double zero at the young age of 37 was quite simply incredible. It was not an honour you earned with half-hearted skills. Well then, let's continue talking about the job over dinner. Susei snapped his fingers, and from behind him a waiter appeared to fill his glass with red wine. Two more waiters also appeared by his side, as if they were servants attending to a prince. Since Kirigiri and I were still underage, we were past the soft drink menu. I chose orange juice, and Kirigiri ordered a coffee. Let us toast to our first meeting, is what I'd like to say, but allow me to refrain. After all, in our world, a toast doesn't signify the start of something, but the end. Susei took a sip of his red wine. The waiters began to lay out plates in front of Susei. Usually when it came to French cuisine, every dish was served one by one, but for some reason they continued to pile dish after dish in front of him. 10 hours, 28 minutes, and 49 seconds. Susei suddenly rattled off another series of digits. That is the time that's passed since I opened the letter challenging me to this dual noir. The time limit from when you can open such a letter to who is victorious being decided is 168 hours. For my own sake, I opened the letter at exactly 10 a.m. today. Susei said with a serious expression on his face. However, he hadn't stopped eating. It occurred to me that most of the food had already disappeared from his plate. When did he... One plate each was placed in front of Kirigiri and me. If we tried to match Susei's pace, the food would be devoured before we could even enjoy it. Uh, Mr. Nanamura, how many dual noir challenges have you participated in up until now? Ah, oh, this would be... the fifth time. Th the fifth time? Ah, oh, I can only call it bad luck. Out of all the detectives I know, there's some who've never even heard of the Dual Noirs. In fact, it's more likely a detective will hear of a Dual Noirs. Naturally, Kirigiri and I knew what a Dual Noir was. Just a little earlier, Kirigiri and I had been wrapped up in one. A Dual Noir was a game organised by an organisation called the Victim's Catharsis Committee. Both a detective and a criminal engage in a deadly duel. After receiving a letter of challenge from a criminal, 
the detective will attempt to solve a case in real time. Unlike what their name suggested, the Victims' Catharsis Committee wasn't a charitable organisation at all. Under the name of providing catharsis for victims of crime, the committee lured participants into their game. It seemed that when it came to recruiting challengers, they particularly aimed for those who were driven by a need for revenge. In other words, by using those who were willing to go as far as murder, the game unfolded. There are approximately over 65,500 detectives registered on the list, and their names were public information. It was assumed that the Victims' Catharsis Committee summoned detectives from this list according to the difficulty of each case. For this, a detective's DSC number was used as a reference. Uh, the further you move up in rank, the amount of detectives decreases. Statistically, it becomes more likely for one to be challenged to a duel noir. Nanamura placed his fork on top of his plate, wiped his mouth with a napkin, then suddenly threw them all behind his back. One of the waiters caught the plate while barely moving an inch. With the space he cleared from throwing away his plate, Nanamura placed his two fingers together on top of the table. Susei began to stare at Kirigiri and me as if he was observing us. I read a file about the case you solved, you two. It was a great case for your induction. The Sirius Observatory was our induction case. And yet even now, every time I remembered that day, I felt a dreadful despair. However, the next one doesn't seem to be so. Looking at the letter of challenge, the culprit seems to not only understand the aim of Duel Noirs far too well, but they also plan to win. That's a troublesome attitude. Seems almost as if they're enjoying the game. It's probably a treat for the spectators as well. Spectators? Oh, you didn't know? Duel Noirs are broadcast in real time. The spectators watch over them during what's called a closed circuit whilst eating and drinking together. You could call it a live viewing. Speaking of which, didn't the mastermind between the previous case say something along those lines? The Victims' Catharsis Committee didn't want to just play a game. They wanted to offer a show. This is all pretty hard to believe. Who on earth would watch a Dull Noir? I can't tell you exactly who watches them. However, there's no doubt that they move in high-class circles. In order to participate in a closed circuit, it's said that the price is equivalent to that of the school fees from a third world country. What an incomprehensible and compassionless comparison. We can compare this to the duel in the arenas of Rome. People paid a lot of money to see blood and people killing each other. They want drama. Of course, I don't think I'd like to see that myself, people being killed so brutally. By the way, why are you after the Victim's Catharsis Committee? asked Susei. We can't leave such an organisation in the wild, I said with a cry from the heart. A great sense of justice, huh? smiled Susei. He then turned to Kirigiri. What about you? Kirigiri hesitated for a moment. There is no reason. Honestly, I haven't received another invite to do so. Uh, uh, wait, we should really be united on this. I turned to retort at Kyoko. Wait, are you telling me you aren't even willing to fight the victim's catharsis committee? No, I'm just interested in having my detective skills recognized. Seriously? You're only interested in moving up the ranks? Are you really satisfied with that? After being manipulated, aren't you at least a bit offended? I do. Now that actually surprised me. Still, she was answering me in that usual expression of hers. She wasn't quite good at showing off her feelings, or rather, she has an incredible poker face. It's not right to hide your emotions behind a stone face, you know. Just try to deal with this organisation with me. Isn't that a detective's job? That we aren't just limited to dealing with immediate threats? I questioned. If Big Sis Yui wants me to help her, then I will. Ugh, Yosh! 
Ah, you're, you're so childish. I chewed my lower lip to control my frustration. Don't you have your own opinion? Are you just a doll that we can control as we please? Kirigiri simply looked at me with cold eyes. Was she actually angry? A detective operating without a client is just fulfilling mere self-satisfaction, Kirigiri said before looking away. Maybe, but at least I'm making an effort to find out the truth. I suddenly got up. Weirdly, it reminded me of my childhood, and especially of my sister. Find the truth? What a childish response. Says the actual child. After my sudden outburst, a sound echoed in the room. I looked at the source of the sound. Suse was holding a mini trumpet. My ears began to ring. All right, no fighting. Honestly, you're like children. No, wait, not even that, but rookies. Even so, from my point of view, he was much worse. He then threw the trumpet with a bitter laugh, and the waiter caught it without a problem. A detective is nothing without an ideology, especially not trustworthy. They're also nothing if they're too self-serving. I guess you two have at least one half of what it means to be a proper detective, said Sushi before shrugging. Kirigiri and I looked at each other for a moment. I'm, I'm sorry, I got carried away, I said as I sat back down, my face flushed from embarrassment. Kirigiri remained silent with her face being stoic. Well, let's go back to our history lesson. Suse said. Since my investigation into the Victims' Catharsis Committee began, the amount of missing detectives have reached the double digits. Double digits? Get what I'm saying? It means that the situation is getting increasingly difficult to back out from. Is that what you got from this investigation into such a dangerous organisation? If so, that that just means that we need to hurry up and eliminate them. Really brave of you, Yui Samidari. The detectives that disappeared would have said the same thing. These detectives were double zeros, yet even they couldn't shake this organisation. It's proof that this situation can't be solved so easily. Say, did you know the Victims' Catharsis Committee is registered as a non-profit organisation? Complete with an office building, people can freely enter and exit. Really? But then, what's the matter? The matter is that the only information that can be gathered is what they have open to the public. They spread detectives thin with so much useless information, while the real information is carefully concealed. If you want to hide leaves, put them in the forest. That good example is written in Father Brown. It's a famous detective novel by G.K. Chesterton. Then what purpose does this group have? Is it really to treat the vengeance of others as some sort of program to watch? From what I know, those who traced this organisation before they disappeared seems to know there was a real purpose to that. There's a purpose? The detective who told me about it is still missing, so maybe he knew the real purpose of the Victims' Catharsis Committee. Or... Well, it definitely wasn't for catharsis. What is it from you, Yui? You refer to the Victims' Catharsis Committee as evil. Isn't that natural? They kill innocent people. But both parties are often criminals, aren't they? You should know that if you've ever participated in a duel noir. Suse challenged me. They're trying to get revenge on someone who's made them suffer in the past, often from a crime. In the past duel noir, the culprit of it was trying to get revenge for his family that was murdered. He wanted to avenge them. Life has also taken away the criminal's common sense. 
Kirigiri challenged as well. They have decided to take revenge on the people who stole from them. In this world, there are people who live their normal lives without being judged for the mistakes they have made, while others live in a miserable life in the depths of society. Life is simply unfair. Don't you think their behaviour is normal? Asked Susei. I can understand that feeling, but it's still unacceptable to turn to violence. I spoke back in retort. In the end, what you're saying is only the opinion of one detective. There is only a thin line that separates justice from evil. For many people, the dual noir is a relief or a holy war. Some people think that challenges are rewarded only because of a necessary evil that can change the world. The victim's catharsis committee was a necessary evil. Is that really the case? Even if there was another reason. When you're determined to kill people, and you choose this path, I think you should be punished no matter what the context is. Haha, <laughs> you really are someone with a strong sense of justice. Susei laughed softly. But if the iron is twisted, it's very difficult to go back once it's done. A child like you can turn out to be the biggest threat. A threat? I didn't expect him to call me that. Don't get too personally involved if you ever want to be married to an adult, he said. Don't let your feelings get in the way of your judgement, Big Sis Yui. Warned Kirigiri. Well, I couldn't think of anything else to answer. For a professional detective, or for Kirigiri, hiding their emotions and not bringing their personal ideas into the business is very easy. I also think it is necessary. However, there's no reason to leave the Victim's Catharsis Committee alone like that. Whatever the circumstances, I don't think it's time to change my mind about an organisation like this. I stretched my neck slightly. No matter the context or despair, a normal human being has to control themselves. So, what they said about youth being both a wound and a sharp knife was correct. Mr. Nanamura, do you really think the culprits of these dual noirs are innocent victims? Yep, but in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't really matter to me. Laughed Susei as he answered without hesitation. Innocent or not, as a detective, my true opponent is mystery. My existence is there to solve those that are right in front of me. Say, don't you think it's more fun solving a mystery solo? And so it's turned into this. This was expected from a double zero. He really trusted his experience. Do you really think that I can forgive criminals? I'm not that naive. He said. I'm sorry I doubted you. That's quite alright. Is there anything else we should know about the Victim's Catharsis Committee? Hmm, I don't know anything else. But I heard another story from a single detective who had been the victim of a dual noir. Just one? We call him the President. A man, or oh, I mean, they could be a woman, who is the brains of it all. Their identity is surrounded by a veil of mystery. One day they founded the Victims' Catharsis Committee. A little less than ten years ago. So, they are the boss of the organisation? If we could reveal the identity of the President, we would be able to charge the Victims' Catharsis Committee as a criminal organisation. The shadow that organisation had casted was beginning to mould itself into a human figure. Who could be the president? Could he have been an ex-detective? Kirigiri said abruptly. Susei raised an eyebrow, placing his elbow on the table to support his chin. Now why do you think that? Dual Noir targets must organise an unsolvable crime and become guilty of a false incident. In fact, it means that the organisation is able to cover up the real culprit in a case, and keep it for a future game. Only a top-notch detective could do that, I spoke. And I was rather surprised from what came out of my mouth. Well, I guess I was getting up there and being high level as well. That's right, you're absolutely correct, Kyoko nodded. 
However, if it is a high-class detective who could find the real criminal very easily, he can survive their little adventure. As long as the rank is high enough, for example, said Kirigiri. The triple zero rank of the detective library counted four people in the past, but one of them disappeared from the records. Perhaps they are the president we are after. This may be a consideration to be taken into account in order to identify the president of the organization, applauded Susei. I'll skip the explanations because to us, time is money. Kyoko Kirigiri, you seem to be able to follow me easily. So, which detective was struck off the books? Kirigiri asked. Unfortunately, I don't know, replied Susei, extending his arms. When I registered in the detective library, there was nothing that could designate his identity. Like most triple zeros. All we know is that he's human. He was probably one of the first detectives in the library. If anyone knows anything, it must be a detective who handles gender cases. As far as I know, one of the founders was in this field. Speaking of the founders, I heard that Kirigiri's grandfather was one of them. It doesn't look like he's registered, but anyways, I might be thinking too much. I was watching Kirigiri's reactions from the corner of my eye, but she didn't seem disturbed. If you're able to speculate that far, why can't anyone find him? Susei took a knife and a fork and raised his arms up. It's because everything is speculation. If one of the triple zeros turned out to be the president, it would be a shock. Why? I asked. There is a difference between time, money, or talent. That's the difference between us and the triple zeros. If they turn out to be criminals, it will have a big impact on the rest of us and our reputations. It's not a joke. It's a fact. And it's not an easily bypassable problem. It's an undeniable defeat, Susei said. For me to be a double zero was already above the clouds, so if someone with a lot of pride like Susei said that, then maybe I should at least admit that I wanted to fight much harder than I already was. There's only one way to get closer to the victim's catharsis committee, said Susei. It's to capture the challenger, the murderer. They are in direct contact and receive private information, but then again, you'll need to know the identity of the murderer. However, if we can do it, it would be a big step. Do you understand? Of course, I exclaimed. I wouldn't let a criminal win. It's a powerful mantra. Suse got up from his chair and looked at his watch. What? Are you planning to leave? We are eating, but time is running out, and time is money, said Suse, waving to the waiter. Even if there wasn't confirmation, it's still a dual noir. Are you sure you want to come? Yes. Yes, I said without hesitation. Coco saw my face and also nodded. Then, let us discuss this dual noir, shall we? The culprit of the dual noir can get funds from the organization in order to purchase their techniques. These techniques range from tactics to weapons, and once their deck is assembled, what they choose will be on display in the letter to the detective. A message for the detective. Heed the cry of the noir. Location, Norman Hotel. 80 million yen. Weapon, knife. 5 million yen. Weapon, revolver. 15 million yen. Weapon, hammer. 3 million yen. Weapon, rope. 3 million yen. Weapon, automobile. 10 million yen. Trick, locked room. 100 million yen. Trick, disappearing act. 100 million yen. Other, cash. 1 billion yen. Total cost, 1 billion 316 million yen. According to the above cost, the following detective is summoned. Susei Nanamura. Like I said, it seems he's the detective to ask. 
I felt a little overwhelmed when my eyes met Kerrigiri's. This time the person had accumulated several weapons and tricks. He could buy from this organisation, the price being marked on the letter. The higher the price and the difficulty, the higher the rank of the detective. I'll tell you the most important things first, said Susei, taking the bag a waiter had handed him. He put the letter inside of it and closed it. In a dual noir, there is a rule that says the criminal cannot kill the detective in charge of investigating. It's because there's no game when the detective's not there. The detective is always asked for through the letter. If you are not the detective, you are just a secondary companion. So it could be that the culprit is one of the victims, even if they're dead. You could die. His voice suddenly resounded. Me and the others, if you think about it, are jumping into a criminal's trap. It may be indeed that if we apply ourselves to all this, you won't get out of it unscathed and wind up a victim. A victim? Those unexpected words made my voice change. We would need to think about this carefully. If we got in the way of the culprit, we could die. Are you scared? said Susei. I, uh, I think I'll be fine. I lied to myself. In contrast, Kyoko looked quite calm and gave the nod of her head. For the criminal to win, they must kill their enemy to get revenge on them, and last 168 hours without being discovered by the detective. If you win the Jewel Noir, you win the amount of money spent on the game. For a criminal wanting to start a new life, that's a good motivation, he said. That sounds like such a desperate situation to wind up in. Exactly. They can put everything aside, including their past, and have a normal life, if they wish. On the other hand, if the detective manages to find out who the culprit is, they will have to refund the money that they spent on the game. If they cannot pay with money, they will have to pay with their life. In tune, I will do the same and fight with my life. In short, it is a game of life and death for our enemy. To stay alive, they're going to do everything they can not to get caught. But I'm not going to be beaten. I became a detective to answer the call for help. If you want to bring justice as a detective, you have to put your life aside. That's the purpose of a detective. As such, I have no qualms about risking it all and even giving up my own life for it all. In contrast, Kyoko was a detective by nature with no sense of purpose outside of the profession. She was involved in this career since she was so young, and is now about to become a detective machine, utterly incapable of feeling death. But no matter how much a detective work was installed in her, she was still just a junior high school girl starting out. The tour noir does not always take place in closed areas, However, as this limits the movement of detectives and drives the police back, these locations are often chosen. The Norman Hotel, which was chosen for this game, is an old abandoned hotel in the mountains. It will be very far from the city. We cannot afford to neglect the preparations. We will probably be there for at least a hundred hours. Suse looked at his watch once again and raised his hand to say goodbye. I have to go now. Suse began to leave when he suddenly turned around, remembering something. Oh, and uh, let's confirm the schedules before that. I'll leave for the Norman Hotel the day after tomorrow, because there's something I absolutely have to do tomorrow. I will leave around 7am with the transport. I'll probably arrive around 10am. Is that okay for you? It's only one day, but... Uh, isn't there a time limit? Oh, with my speed, we shouldn't be late. There's no problem. Oh, okay. Let us pray for our victory. Susei then headed for the exit of the private room, before completely diverting to the windows. He opened one of them. A strong wind rushed into the room. Susei moved his legs to the other side of the window. Good luck! He gave us a thumbs up and jumped out of the window. M Mr. Nanamura! I quickly got out of the chair and rushed to the window that was still open. I then saw him slowly descend towards the illuminated city, a parachute deployed. The big sky blue parachute added something to the beauty of the city. Were the high ranking detectives all like this? I froze for a moment, watching the man slowly descend. 
The sound of cutlery made me return to my senses. A waiter came to close the window, blocking the wind. Well, let's continue this meal, even if we're worried. D-Day is only the day after tomorrow. Big Sis Yui, said Kirigiri. This could be our last Christmas. Don't say such a thing. Of course we won't be killed so easily. We'll have more Christmases after this. And I'll protect you. I couldn't get those words out of my throat. I could only superimpose Kirigiri's possible death based on my little sisters. Because of that, I didn't even want to think about it. I didn't really trust Susei. Moreover, if I let myself be trapped in my little sister's illusion, it could be annoying for the investigation. I forced myself to drop her. I'll do my best for the duel noir. I guess I don't have a choice if I want to improve my rank. It was still my little sister's voice. Hey, big sis Yui. Kirigiri was young, but her voice sounded very adult. We must survive the duel noir, no matter what happens there. A waiter approached me and gave me something that looked like a fine notebook. When I opened it, I discovered the dinner bill. 62,248 yen. So, uh, Mr. Tsusei Nanamura didn't pay? The waiter tilted his head and smiled to remind me of his presence. I checked my wallet, but I only have two 2,000 yen bills on me. Uh, what'll we do? I whispered to Kirigiri. Ah, that damn detective. His spectacular exits and entries has shown he has money, but he likes to keep it. Calm down, big sis Yui, Kirigiri replied gently. She then took her card out of her wallet. Can I pay it once? Certainly. After settling everything, the waiter bowed and then left us alone. Kirigiri, you're so cool. Once dinner was over, we left the building. Even if we moved as far away as possible, it was impossible not to see it. Lights that were almost blinding to our eyes were emanating powerfully from across the city. I felt like I was in paradise under the ocean, walking with Kirigiri. The Christmas lights were comforting, and a row of Christmas trees illuminated the faces of passers-by. Well, now that we're here, I can walk you home, I said. Kirigiri remained silent for a moment, listening to the sounds of the night. She then turned around and started to walk away on her own. No need, it's too late anyways. I'll send you a message. But alone at this hour? Kirigiri leaned her head and said to me over her shoulder. Maybe if it was a foreign country, but there's nothing threatening of the roads of this country. But if a man is attracted to young girls like you, he could do that. I tried to attack her from behind to grab her neck. But the next thing I knew, she was gone. She then appeared behind me and put my arms behind my back. Da, 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 da. Oh, th this hurts. See, I can defend myself. She released my arm. You need to be careful, Big Sis Huey. If you tried, you could probably beat an older man with a high kick from those legs of yours. Be careful though, because if a man really wanted to attack you, you probably won't be up to it. Of course I will. Did you take a self-defense course? Actually, if it's possible, can you teach me that trick too? I'm going now, Kirigiri said as she looked at the straight clock. Uh, let's just go back together anyways. I, I want to talk to you a little more. It's quite boring being alone. Kirigiri frowned, creating a wrinkle on her forehead. She kept walking without looking at me. I ran up to her. We can keep talking about... What, teaching you self-defense? No, ab about the president of the Victim's Catharsis Committee. What's the matter? Well, he's a former detective and one of the founders of the Detective Library. Couldn't it be your grandfather? It's very dramatic, but no, it's not him. How can you know that? I asked. My grandfather was never registered in the library. He told me that before. He never became a triple zero, and it's not registered, so I couldn't be deleted. But did her grandfather tell her the truth? Are you sure he's not lying to you? 
A grandfather would never tell his granddaughter that he's the president of such an organization. My grandfather is very proud to be a Kirigiri, more than anyone else in my family. He would never settle for being put in boxes like the library ranks. He was against the whole DSC classification system in the first place. Just pride? I opposed. I've never heard of this family. She came from a detective family, there was no doubt about it. She has these abilities at only 13 years old. Maybe she really comes from a big detective family and that blood flows through her veins, but I haven't seen any other detective react to the name Kirigiri. Even Susei, who was a double zero. I know what you're thinking. The Kirigiri family are good detectives, but we don't want to be known. We live in the shadows. So the ordinary detectives don't know us. That's why my grandfather didn't register in the library, to protect the Kirigiri pride. We almost never talk about ourselves. It's an incredible story. But why did you, Kyoko, register in the library? Isn't that against your family's principles? At least according to your grandfather? First, my grandfather technically lives abroad, so he doesn't fight crime from here. It's impossible for him to be the president of a small organization located only in Japan. Yeah, if that's true, he's on another level. Sorry for doubting your grandfather, Kirigiri. Even adults fight crimes like this anonymously, ignoring the opinion of the public and the government. But maybe he knows the president of the Victims' Catharsis Committee. I mean, he was the president of the library. I wonder about that, but there's nothing I can do about it. Maybe if you say your name, an official will recognize him. It's probably easier to sneak in discreetly. It doesn't matter. It'll always be the same thing. What do I do after that? How can I sue the president of such a non-profit organization? Kirigiri looked troubled, and she moved her fingers closer to her face, as if to warm them with her breath. Ah, whatever. Everything ends up being discovered, like how Al Capone ended up being nabbed for tax fraud. There's probably something that can be put on him, as long as we can stop the dual noir. Such an extreme line of justice. That's no different than succumbing to evil. Ugh. Yes, but being around all the time thinking about conspiracy theories will do worse than better. For now, we should put up the president's case aside. Let's try to clean up what's in front of us. I was really getting told by a girl who was younger than me. That's right, we have already made good progress. Susei Nanamura's dual noir had already started for 12 hours. We must remain calm. We'll think about how everything will go after we arrest the dual noir criminal. If we manage to get outside of the hotel alive. We continued to walk, our minds clouded with questions. Kirigiri suddenly stopped. Uh, what? What's the matter? We have arrived. I looked up to see a huge traditional house with a huge door. I had trouble closing my mouth. The street lights continued along the hill and the white barriers extended far and wide. Were there any houses like that left? In this case, it was the largest traditional house I'd ever seen. I watched Kirigiri, my eyes full of jealousy. Yes, she was definitely a lady. My curfew has already passed, Kirigiri said. Fortunately, you're not a man, because even for a detective, he would have been angry. Kirigiri seemed a little uncomfortable. If you had a curfew, you should have told me. We would have left sooner, I said. Oh, it was because I was talking to you that I'm late, Kirigiri replied with cold eyes. Yeah, it's because I've talked too much. I'm sorry, but I, I, had to, I had to absolutely be sure what we discussed. If you say so. I'll explain the situation, if that works. Well, that would help me quite a deal, she said, slightly softer tone than before. I felt rather pleased from it all. Kirigiri walked to the large gate before stopping. The gate was made of wood, and I could only imagine the splinters that would be caught by touching it. It was still quite warm, but there were no signs, just an intercom. Uh, aren't you coming home? Only outsiders go through the front door. Family access is through the back, she said as she walked along the wall. How formal. The massive trees planted on the other side did not allow me to see behind the gate. It was difficult to see the majestic residence, but it was impossible to see human presence. For someone who didn't know the place, the residence was a total mystery. 
Do you live with your grandfather or alone? It depends, but there are three maids. One person is always there. Servants, are you serious? Since the school we went to was full of young girls, it was not difficult to hear that some families hired maid servants so they would not leave their daughter alone. One of these families was Kyoko's. She had neither her father nor her mother. I didn't have the details, so I didn't understand the situation well, but I easily understood that I shouldn't ask more questions. By the way, didn't you live abroad for a while? Yes, with my grandfather. I stayed there for five years. Then I had to come back to this school, as I was already enrolled here. Kirigiri said. It had to happen at some point. There's a small portal that allows easy access. Hmm, my life is very different from yours. Really? Kirigiri stoically replied. We walked along the fence for a while until Kirigiri pointed to a specific place. There was a small gate to make it easier to get in. She took out the key of her pocket, inserted it and turned the key. The gate opened easily. Eh? You had the key for this place on hand? The problem isn't about me having the key, the problem is what to do afterwards. Is sneaking into your room not on the table? He'll definitely catch me. Uh, so what should I do? I asked. Wait here, I'll call Grandpa. Okay, I'll wait. I'll be back soon. Uh, wait a minute. What? Uh, wouldn't it be better if you took that hat off your head? I replied, pointing at the Santa's hat that was on her head. She pushed it slightly. I watched it fall at my feet. Choco looked rather surprised. What is it? Uh, didn't you notice? I picked up the hat and encouraged Kirigiri. Hey, you, you better go. Oh, yeah. Kirigiri walked towards the door of the house. Once Kirigiri was out of sight, I put my hands in my pockets and leaned against the fence. It's unusual for Kirigiri to panic. Maybe her grandfather was that strict. Or maybe she really loves her grandfather. That must have been it. For her, who didn't have parents, it must have been difficult. I looked up at the sky, looking at the street lights. Suddenly, little white glitter began falling from the sky. A white Christmas? On Christmas Eve, I'm often alone, wondering what I'll do next year, and my anxiety overwhelms me. This year, I met a girl named Kyoko Kirigiri, whose presence really helped me. I no longer have this feeling of loneliness and emptiness. We're both detectives too. Will she be here again next year? I was imagining our future, two detectives always together. I didn't want a dark future, but wasn't that the fate of a detective? Uh, Big Sis Yui. I heard a voice, I saw the large gate was open. I turned around to see Kirigiri looking at me with concern. Uh, where's your grandfather? I walked away from the white barriers by redoing the button on my coat. I approached Kirigiri looking behind her, but there was no one there. You're the man who wants to seduce my Kyoko! The voice came from above my head. An old man wearing a kimono was on the wall. I only noticed it now. I stepped back before being pulled forward again, put on the ground. A short time before, I was quietly contemplating the sky. It was disturbing to see an old man jump off a wall that high. The old man's cane kept me on the ground. Was he really that strong? He lifted it up and tried to hit my head. Wait, it's not her, she's a woman. What? He pulled his cane away, lifted me up and grabbed my chest. What are you doing? I shouted, clearing the man's hand. I jumped away. It's Big Sis Yui, the detective who goes to the same school as me. Oh, is that true? He said, scratching his white hair. Sorry, I heard Kyoko was going to eat with a boy. Excuse me for the misunderstanding. Despite his white hair, he looked pretty young. His hair was shiny, his wrinkles discreet. He stood up straight and his eyes were shiny with life. He had a cane in his right hand, but his legs didn't seem weak. Maybe it was some kind of weapon for him. I'm glad to know that Kyoko has made a friend. Was that you who called? He said with a smile. He looked like another person with that soft smile on his face. You're taking care of my granddaughter. 
I'm so embarrassed. She was always alone and didn't seem to be used to life here. I was getting worried. If she has a good partner like you, then I can relax. Right, Kyoko? Yes. Uh, I'm sorry for delaying Kyoko and making her miss a curfew. She didn't seem familiar with life here and I wanted to make sure she didn't get hurt. Kirigiri was half hidden behind her grandfather's back. She seemed more comfortable than usual. We both talked about the incident and that took a long time. I didn't know there was a curfew. Please don't punish her. Eh, I always wondered who Kyoko would bring back to me. Anyways, don't worry. There's an exception to every rule. If it involves a detective case, I'm willing to forgive her. For the Kirigiri family, detective business is very important and comes first. Even death does not deviate from its purpose. Uh, oh, so... If it was detective related, then that curfew crap can wait, he said with a merry laugh. Was that what Kirigiri's grandfather taught? It sure explained a lot. Still, glad he wasn't unreasonable. Honestly, when he knocked me down and groped my chest, I was expecting the worst. Still, from what I'm seeing, he's a pretty agreeable guy. Though perhaps that could be just his love for Kyoko spoiling her. Heh, <laughs> thought I was a grouchy old man. It's all over your face. Uh, 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 sorry. Like I said, when it comes to being a Kirigiri, being a detective goes past one's family, even death itself. Isn't that right? Yes, Grandpa. Ah, huh, that's my girl. If it is for a case and to see Koko become a first-rate detective, then I suppose it's worth keeping the gate unlocked at night. Really? Koko asked in wonder. Oh, of course. As long as you're focused on your duty. Then I'll do my best to be a good detective, Kirigiri replied, her eyes shining. Good girl, said the grandfather as he stroked Kirigiri's head. She and her grandfather seemed quite happy. I felt a little uncomfortable in front of the stage, but I couldn't help but think it was cute. Uh, uh, tomorrow we'll have to solve a dual noir case, so Koko will be spending the night somewhere else. Uh, of course I'll also be there with you, is that alright? Oh, of course. Well, it was easy, but sending his little girl without hesitation into such a case. He didn't seem to be afraid of death of his loved ones. Did he know a lot about the dual noirs? He must have heard about the victim's catharsis committee thanks to Kyoko. He at least knows a little. Maybe he even knew more than we did. Such a great detective who is also the founder of the detective library necessarily knows more. I hesitated for a long time, not knowing if I should ask him or not. The man spoke again. Well, it's about time we head inside. You should go home too, Yui. It's cold tonight, and you need to prepare to investigate. Shall I call a cab for you? Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm fine. Well, it was a pleasure to meet you. Kyoko, can you see you're off? I slowly lowered my head, always thinking. Uh, may I ask you for another ch- There was no old man left in front of me. I was looking around, but nothing. Nowhere. He had disappeared, completely missing. Uh, Big Sis Yui, maybe you should go home, said Kirigiri near the gate. I hadn't noticed it, but I was tired. The tension from my heavy breath disappeared, and I could feel the fatigue falling on my shoulders. I'm sorry to have bothered you, Big Sis Yui. Uh, it's okay. I'd let an old man touch my chest if it's for you, I said, removing the dust from my coat. But I didn't know your grandfather was so... focused on your education. Still, it's great he's not so uptight. Hey, Big Sis Yui? Yeah? It's weird to choose detective work over family, yes? Well, I, I wouldn't call it strange, just... Well, it does seem to involve a lack of caring about people's feelings in the matter, I said after a degree of thought. People's feelings? Are you asking because you have doubts over your detective work? No, that's not it. Anyway, what Grandpa said earlier, that detective work was more important than the death of a family member. Don't you think it's strict? Well, I find it stranger than strict, but I guess that's your family's opinion of detectives. No, it's different. For my family, work is really more important than the death of a family member. It's not a suggestion. 
It's an obligation, a dogma. Okay. I think it might be beautiful. It means you're very proud to be a detective, right? Don't you think it's abnormal? Kirigiri continued. She had so much pride in her work as a detective that I could hardly see her doubting that. She was raised into it during her childhood, which made the thought of her doubts even harder to fathom. Still, what do you think? I asked her. I don't think it's abnormal. I think it's a good mentality, said Kirigiri. I thought for a moment to say that she didn't have to continue, but she opened her mouth before me. But I feel like I forced myself to think like that. Like I live like a real detective, because I don't want to feel empty. For her, her life was all about detective work, but even still. As long as I'm here, you won't be alone or empty. I hugged her. I wanted to stay that way, Kirigiri said looking at me. Of course, you're the coolest, most pure detective I know. Let's do our best together, tomorrow and for as long as possible. Ah. Oh. Well, goodbye. Separating myself from Kirigiri, who walked back with a shyish look on her face. I laid my hand on the gate. I gave her one last look before running to the dormitories, the snow accompanying me. My curfew passed a long time ago. The dormitories were guarded, so I discreetly passed through a window. <laughs> violating the rules on Christmas night. It felt quite nice. Chapter 1. End.